Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. And welcome to episode 185 of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. I am Chris Jordan, your host, coming to you live tonight from Austin, Texas. I am actually back home off the road. Unfortunately, uh, my good friend Stephen Bishop could not be here this evening, but he is tuning in via remote. Uh, Hope you were doing well, Stephen. Uh, Tonight, um, I have the great, great pleasure of speaking with... Robert Walter, uh, the president and executive director of the Joseph Campbell Foundation. You can keep up with all of the great work of Joseph Campbell, the ongoing uh, release of works as they are compiled, things like that at jcf.org. And we'll talk a little bit about that website, a little bit about its founding, a little bit how it was actually one of the first websites on the Internet. Um, that even provided information like this in a philosophic realm, uh, literarily, things like that. And uh, the work of Robert Walter has been absolutely amazing. He has such a career that we'll get into um, everything from uh, spending some time as a Jesuit novitiate. Uh, He was also a professional playwright and director Uh, And shortly after that, in about 79, began to personally work with Joseph Campbell on several projects, um, including the multi-volume Historical Atlantis of World, or uh, Atlas, not Atlantis, Historical Atlas of World Mythology. Um, And after his death was left as the executor of the literary works of Joseph Campbell and is the one responsible for building this website and kind of disseminating uh, this knowledge in a modern day realm. So uh, after that quick fumble, let's welcome uh, Robert Walter. How are you doing this evening, sir? I'm 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 doing good, Chris. I'm I'm busily looking for that lost city under the sea, though. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I I intend to do a whole episode on Atlantis coming up soon. So, um, well, see, it's yeah. on your mind. There you go. And and well, and, Joe's, you know, Joe's Joe's approach was historical atlas of world mythology, and uh, it was a uh, um, it was sort of the culmination of his thinking about this. Um, I don't want to get a, you know, ahead of what you want to talk about, but at some point, oh, that's let's, all right. let's come back and visit what the popular understanding of, of the seminal Joseph Campbell is and what my experience of his actual explorations were, was. Well, absolutely. And I mean, I, of course, one of the questions, I kind of put things out there to some people that I know, um, my good friend Michael Devine from the Gray Matters podcast, uh, things like that. Like, what were some of the questions that, like, if you could talk to this gentleman, uh, what are some of the questions you'd ask? And, of course, I got questions from people from everything from uh, what what was it like to influence a work like Star Wars um, with with your concepts of philosophy and world religion, um, things like that, to uh, – why why is it that initiation rituals as we know them have left our society um mm. and and these are a lot of things that i definitely want to talk about tonight because they're they're huge archetypes that that span throughout time that have really made part of humanity what it is um and there are some cultures that cling tightly to these and these are the cultures that we see like native americans everything else where they still have a great cultural identity um, of themselves of as far as what they themselves have maintained despite what history says um yet still we in the modern world do not have that uh and it's it's really strange well, you the know, way maybe that, um i mean we do but not you to know, the same depends on how you want to look at it if you want to look at what's going on right now in a lot of the world with tribalism and balkanization that's people who are who are fundamentally bound to um, old stories that, in fact, an, an old cultural view that that I would argue is is markedly out of step with the global um, perspective mm. that is going to be necessary for the species survival. 
Um, but that's, you know, so when you talk about embracing culture and having culture as a base, it's important. Uh, absolutely. And it gives you a sense of identity and purpose. And it, you know, it's one of the major sort of Campbell's four functions of myth. But if that becomes exclusive, um, you know, and, and, and separatist, you, you get the kind of polarization that you're seeing now um, all over the globe. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a knife that cuts two ways. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, mythology in that sense can be used to bring people together. It can also be used to demonize others and to separate people. And uh, so, you know, and it, isn't, it's interesting. it isn't, you know, it isn't all just because it's old. It's great. No, no, absolutely not. And it's interesting it, uh, that we saw that kind of pop its head up really about uh, six years ago when 2012 happened. And of course, the uh, coming of the Mayan prophecy. And a lot of people just, as you were just saying, uh, don't necessarily interpret things the same way. And it was one of those like, no, this is really more a concept of cycles and knowledge. And the fact of now that it's 2012, like it's nighttime, it's the application of knowledge. We've gained knowledge in the past cycle. There's a real, um, you know, critical distinction there. And and, and that is is sort of in how different cultures view time. And we in the West have certainly have this historical linear sense of time. Um, that's not, that's not the case in, um, Mayan culture or in many others. So there's the fundamental difference in, um, whether, you know, Joe wrote an essay very early on in his career was, you know, um, time linear or circular, um, in which he talks about how yes. the perception of how we perceive time and how that impacts how we then, um, live our lives and, and, you know, and address, you know, everything that comes at us in the course of a lifetime. So, yeah, well, yeah. right now yeah. we're still in this this historical perspective of marching forward. The Mayan weren't. I mean, you know, that it was a, it was another revolution, but, you know, and revolution, evolution round and round the earth. And, you know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. It's a, a, a basic, you know, these epics and these cycles exist in all kinds of cultures. Uh, we... In our scientific perspective, we want to sort of smooth that all out and lay it out in a linear fashion so we can put, you know, um, like benchmarks and, and you know, uh, m- metrics I- I- into the equation, I-, I guess, in the sense that that will, you know, move us forward or help us better understand our past. I, I-, I question whether that's the case, but I think that's the perceived understanding. I I think with the with an open mind um and it just just for a little reference folks if if you want a quick um just glancing over of kind of a, a good encompassing of some of the concepts of jo- Joseph Campbell go check out um on Netflix Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth with Bill Moyers um, oh, yeah, that's, I, that's critical. I, I literally you know, Chris, let watched me that. Something here go ahead. Too, to go put ahead. That in some, let me put that in some perspective for, for, the, for our listeners. Uh, it, you know, when, when I started working with Joe in 1979, he hadn't published a book since the early 70s, and no one was interested in publishing him. And he'd been working for years on this multi-volume historical atlas. Um, and and so, you know, we kept going. And uh you know, he he originally was doing it from McGraw Hill through a studio that a man named Alfred Vandermark ran in Lucerne, and they'd been working for years on that. And then one day McGraw Hill shut the studio down, and uh, and then uh, this is you know right about the time I came in, and uh, and was what was going to do with all this work that's been out there, and I, I I got it was sent back to me because there was no place for it to go. Joe lived his whole life in a little two room apartment in the village where the bedroom was his study. And, you know, they, they lived on a fold out, he and his wife lived on a fold out couch in the living room. And Fred had one office in McGraw Hill. So the understanding was that they were going to go off and, you know, Fred would take this someplace else. He was a well-established publisher. He'd done things like the Da Vinci codices and, you know, and uh, no one was interested and no one was interested in Joe. We kept working on this for Mm. years and, uh, you know, it kept growing and expanding from one volume to two to four. He was approaching his 80s, uh, but no one was interested. And I mean, there was a point at one point where I said to him at one day, I said, you know, uh, hey, do, 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 you know, do you ever get frustrated? And he said, well, sure, I'm human. Of course I do. You do. Why? And I said, well, I'm pretty frustrated right now. And I'm not 
sure how to deal with that. And he said, well, you know, you have to keep what you do positively impacts one person, then it will have been worth it. And I, I kind of nodded and I think I walked away thinking, yeah, right, sure. You know, <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that sounds all philosophically interesting, but it doesn't address my frustration. <laughs> um, ultimately, ultimately, we had to start our own publishing company. I mean, mortgage our houses, um, you know, start a publishing company, and we did. And then nobody wanted to distribute the book. Uh, and so, you know, there had been a, Joe and and Bill had had a conversation in the early '80s um, on Bill Moyer's journal, and these were one-hour interviews that he had with, you know, international figures, a mm-hmm. lot of politicians, mm-hmm. and. Uh, his conversation with Joe had been so interesting to him that he let the cameras roll and it became a two parts and they'd gotten at that time that, you know, they, you could get transcripts by writing into public broadcast and they got 10,000 requests for transcripts, um, which was more than they'd gotten for anything else. And so there was clearly this interest, uh, but when we were about to release the book on which we had, you know, our entirely livelihoods, Finally, you know, we finally got a distributor. Um, you know, I, I went up to see Bill, uh, to see Bill's, uh, who, you know, his producer, to see if I could get the tapes from that um, interview because Joe was deep in the midst of the Atlas and uh, he was going to be on a lecture tour when we when we released the book and I wanted to edit a loop um, that, that is him talking about it. And in the course of that conversation, Bill Morris was still at CBS, and I was talking with this producer about whether he was, you know, what was going to happen. This is the conversation going on um, in, in, in New York in, in journalism circles. Is Bill going to go back to public broadcast? Is he going to stay at CBS? And so she said, well, they'd like him back, but the one thing she knew is that he did not want to come back and just do talking heads. He wanted yeah. something with scope and sweep. And I said, well, Joe's working on this four-volume historical atlas of world mythology. How's that for, for sweep? <laughs> and, uh, and so I sent her stuff, and we were releasing the first volume, and I, and, you know, I sent her some stuff to going out further that we were working on. And we, dis- you know, um, we, we decided we, that we would t- try to get Bill and Joe in one place and see if we could just get them to talk. And it took about a year for her to convince Bill and for me to convince Joe. And we had a dinner at which uh, also present was uh, um, Al Perlmutter and uh, his wife, Joan Connor, um, oh, became wow. the dean of this. Okay. And we were at the New York Athletic Club. And we decided that what we would do is that we would have um, the day when Joe came from Hawaii, which is where he was living then, to the West Coast, that we would work it out to get together and that they would just talk. And I called George Lucas and asked if they could do it at Skywalker. And he said, yes. And Alvin and Joan picked up the camera people. And this went on then for about two and a half years. Um, uh, Once or twice, you know, in a given year, I think altogether is maybe four or five different filming sessions. Um, But no, we had no idea what this was going to be. It was just the two of them talking in the beginning it was about this book that Joe was deeply immersed in. And then, you know, then they sort of went off script because the rest was speculative and they got into a series of conversations. And then and it is, it they is had such one a final one in, roadmap to thinking. Yeah. At the at the end of, uh, you know, Joe died in October 87. And in, in that summer, he came back to New York and they did one last episode at the museum, at the American Museum of Natural History, where Bill had filmed his earlier conversations with Joe and um, Joe, you know, Joe went back to Hawaii, was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, underwent radiation treatments and died of a heart attack. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, and a week before that, um, my partner, Fred Vandermark's wife had died. And, uh, and so everything was just on the floor uh, with the publishing company, which had grown immensely. But then Bill had made um, – we didn't know for sure, but he decided to come back to, to public broadcast and made this all-in bet that he was going to do um, – he was going to turn these conversations into what became the power of myth. And it became the most watched 
public broadcast ever. It's raised more money for public broadcast than any other program that's ever run. It's back again on Netflix um, yes. you know, from 1988. So, and, um, and quite honestly, that was it, it, it was not my introduction to Joseph Campbell. I had, I had heard the name. I'd heard the concepts. I had never really had a chance to um, – read any lectures, see anything. And I got into philosophy um, shortly before my freshman year in college, which was when I spent time in the seminary. Um, And even after the seminary, continued on at University of Dallas, studying philosophy, studying theology, spent years in youth ministry, teaching theology and concepts of world religion, things like that. Um, But when I first saw uh, on the power of myth, it yeah it was a paradigm shift it was a it was a total yeah. change in uh the way i processed information on not just religion but on faith yeah um yeah. and i think i i think it's so important to number 1 uh explain that difference and he does such a great job explaining the difference between religion and spirituality um, yes. The difference between having a religious concept and a spiritual concept, um, and I'd, I'd very much like to let's let's kind of take a couple steps back and really talk about the root of Joseph Campbell and um, what what he believes mythology is, where it's rooted, where it comes from, and where it's leading us. Okay. Um. The roots, I guess we start with the roots, right? Sure. Um, the roots um, of, of mythology really go back to um, ancient stories um, that were nurtured over generations by um, individuals and in various societies in which they lifted up, if you will, um, narrative elements that were metaphoric of their experience. Uh, And if you can imagine, for example, if you ever played telephone um, where somebody whispers something to the first person and while life is going on, (laughs) it passes person to person, you know, in in 30 people, you, you know, it, it, but you hear at the end, there's little resemblance to the beginning. So if you can imagine what happens, if, you're talking 30 or 300 generations that these stories are, are passed down. Um, you, you begin to understand that they must have had s- tremendous import. And, how, and if you look, as Joe did in his later works, particularly at, at what the, has been left behind, not just in the narratives, but in the depiction of those narratives in rock art and in, um, and in ritual and in some of the um, – artifacts that that we have come upon um, that that when you decode them you, you you're suddenly facing or hearing these universal stories so the, the the roots of mythology are are our human attempt to um make meaning of our experiences by casting it in narrative or ceremonial form um and and they and and it you know the, they are deeply rooted in, in, in the natural environment from which they arise. And, and that's kind of important um, in, in talking. Like if you, if you ask a lot of people about, about Campbell, the first thing they talk about is, you know, is his, his hero's journey, the idea of the, of the heroic sure. archetype that is in all these stories. And, and, and that leads quickly to, um, you know, Jungian concepts of, of, universalism um and 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 campbell is it is often then cast into this 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 place and, and in fact you know it is the hero's journey in these epic cycles that he cites in the hero of a thousand faces that inspired george lucas and that is so much a part of our video games and uh, you know and, and our our popular cinema and and oh, and, yeah. and all other manners of creative expression but the, the most by the time we got to historical atlas um He'd spent the rest of his life trying to say, okay, if there are these universals, well, then why are there why are there differences, and what are the differences, and what causes them? And in the title to that book and in the work itself, he finally settled on historical 
that is the state of historical development of the culture, and atlas, the environment in which the culture is cast. So you, consequently, stories that come, say, out of the deserts of the Middle East are similar to stories that come out of the deserts of the Southwest or the deserts of Australia. And they're not very translatable to people who live, say, along the coast of Japan or in the Pacific Northwest um, you know, or in the Mediterranean where their life is around the sea. So, and that's because these myths are metaphors. They're encoded um, transmissions of the human experience. And so they work with what's around you. And so consequently, um, environment is huge. Um, and it's one of the challenges we have right now because a lot of the old stories that have come down to us come from you know, cultural landscape, from cultures and landscapes or cultural landscapes where that, that are just not familiar to us today. Um, you know, and, 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 and at the end, you get those same kind of clashes because people are, are using, uh, are living into a metaphoric perception of the world that's not, you know, not translatable to someone else. Um, and yet when you find these, you know, these, these certain uh, look, Prometheus story um, you know, out of Greece. And, you know, that same story is back in the Caucasus to this day. And grandfather is, yeah. you know, is, yeah. is held down in the mountains, just like Prometheus was held down. And periodically the chains are severed and you have earthquake and grandfather wakes. So, so these stories have roots in, in human experience. They brought us to this point, but now we're now as Joe in his later life was, was pointing out the only viable tribe is, 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 is the human tribe and you know from space um was big deal for him man on the moon looking back and saying here now our eyes have seen this bright blue marble in space and yeah. there are no distinctions there are no others so the proper you know environment becomes the planet um the interrelated planet and but we're still you know we're still chasing down the the vestiges of um you know of of, of tribalism that that resurface, you know, resurface, you know, a magnified because of the change that people are experiencing. You know, well, and and I, I think that at one point, at, at least at one point, a couple of points within at least the history of America, um, we, we have kind of hit that swing of the pendulum where it starts to go that way. Where, where it definitely starts to go the way, like a, a prime example would be like the mission to go to the moon. Um, the the original uh, um, civil rights movement where, where there seemed to be so many people unified for the same cause, um, working together, able to accomplish things that were never accomplished before. Uh, some of them, at least in the Apollo program, within the history of mankind never never right. accomplished before some of them right. never accomplished since right. um, well chris you know you take me right to the point that is my current big soapbox and that is that and that takes us back to campbell's hero's journey and, yeah. and the stories that he encapsulated and even even star wars and, and what what there, there's a, a a misperception that that we've all bought into and that is for example that the odyssey is the story of ulysses it's the story of Ulysses and his men and the yes. culture that he came from. The, 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 the Buddhism is the story of the Buddha. No, it's the story of the Buddha in this culture. So these figures that we lift up um, are, are paradigmatic of, of, the, of, the, of that culture, and it gets refined over generations and over retellings. And for me right now, you've gone right to the place that you know, is my soapbox, and that is that we really have to rethink the hero. I try, we have Bob. to start to come to some idea of an ensemble hero or a collective hero. Um, yes. It isn't the guy who walked on the moon. It's all the people who put him there. And yeah. I think you even see this in popular culture. You know, I grew up in the time of Batman and Superman, you know, and, and those franchises play out pretty quickly. Um, what's taken their place? You know, masters of the universe, you know, uh, <laughs> collectives. And I, I did this long mm -hmm. interview with, with uh, Bill Shatner for a, a thing called Get a Life, a video yes. he did. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, at one point he said, you know, uh, well, I was the hero that came to see me. And I said, no, Bill, you weren't. And he said, well, who was the hero? And I said, the hero was the enterprise because it 
went where no man could go. And yeah. you wanted to know why it endured? Because there were always three people on the bridge. There were always three points of view, and we live in a three-dimensional universe. And we need three points of view, minimal, to solve any problem. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, we have to re- – We that doesn't mean that every single individual isn't challenged to act heroically. But – the hero is is the enterprise. The hero are the things that we together commit ourselves to furthering, um, which we yeah. couldn't do alone. Well, and that's that's just it. And I think that that is what we, what we've kind of lost sight of as a society and as a humanity is the fact that the the hero is the commonality. Yeah. Um, yeah. You cannot have the hero's journey without the epic failure. It's just true. like just like any Disney movie, I challenge you to find me a Disney movie where tragedy does not befall at the beginning. Well, you and know. through that tragedy, <laughs> we have triumph. We have we have a drawing out of oneself and a realization of your impact on the world around you. It was the same thing. And sometimes with J- it's positive, Jason like and the that, Golden Chris, Fleece, some, uh, yeah, with yeah. with Heracles, with Prometheus, yeah. everything. Even Jesus. Well, you know, we, we cling we cling to the more positive narratives. Um, you know, uh, the, the 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 more fundamental you know piece, the sobering piece of this, um, through all of this is you know you, you know where is the roots of mythology? Well, Campbell says it comes from two things: the recognition of death uh, and the awakening of awe. Um, hmm. The recognition hmm. of death. You know, is is sobering. Life lives on life. You know, he loved to he, he loved to say you, you would tease vegetarians and saying, you know, what what what's your problem? You, you didn't hear the lettuce scream and the carrot can't run away from you. Yeah. And when people <laughs> he would say people would say, oh, Doctor Campbell, you know, oh, you know, you, they give him the honorific of doctor, though he wasn't. Um, yeah, you, you're you're so enlightened. There must, you know, do you do you, do you have a special diet? And he would well, say, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, the what? And he says, "Well, the Glenlivet and rare roast beef." That's it. Um, and, you know, and so, even even yeah. in uh, he he even talks about it in uh, and the power of myth on uh, on Netflix, yep. where you can go check that out. Where he's talking about yep. being conscious and aware is instinctual. Um, if you look at the heliotrope, if you look at any flower, yeah. you can't say it's not conscious. From the time it buds right. and seeds, it is actively right. following the sun for photosynthesis and survival. That takes yep. a level of consciousness in and of itself. Oh, whether yeah. whether you call it inbred genetic consciousness that is the same as a shrimp a shrimp has a cerebral ganglion it's like three nerves that come together at one point joe 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 in the historical atlas begins you know after he lays out a whole lot of of creation myths including what he calls the scientific creation Mm -hmm. myths he, he comes to what he calls the will in nature and it's exactly what you're talking about you know, this, that the flower knows how to turn to the, you know, turn to the sun. That the yeah. the salmon knows how to migrate back to the place yeah, of its the, birth. That the, the shrimp the knows where danger is. You know, is placed on the mother's breast and knows how to suckle. So, so well, the, the this it's, it's the same energy. The, the the other piece of it, though, which I think is worth talking about for a minute, please. is there's no escaping um, the recognition of death. You know, and uh, you know we can we can avoid it. We can you know not think. You know, we can buy our chickens under under plastic wrap and not you yeah. know, make any connection to the living entity, or ever the same sort of disregard um, f- for the vegetable. But the other, which is is I think one place where 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 there is a challenge and an opportunity uh, is is the second thing is the awakening of awe. So the mythology also comes out of something that's just so awesome that it knocks your socks off. And, and, you, and you need to try to figure out how to explain it and share it and integrate it. And then, first of all, it, you, know, you have to tell somebody because things we know scientifically don't, don't register if they're not enfolded in a narrative that's shared. You know, they, they go away. Um, but he points out that you know, the, the scientific rationalism that comes in begins to try to explain everything. And then the explanation gets in the way of the experience. So you know, 
he coined that into people say they're looking for the meaning of life. I think they're looking for the rapturous experience of being alive. Yes. Because, you know, the brain can get in there and the brain tries to philosophically understand it or, or fit it into a theological perspective. And, and quickly the, the awesomeness of the phenomenon itself goes away. And we can live in the most, I mean, I'm up in the Sierras right now. It's awesome scenery. Um, I can go a whole day and, and, you know, and, and, <laughs> and ignore it. Um, or I can take a, you know, walk to the window and, and, and just have my breath taken away by the mountain face in front of me. Um, that's an opportunity I'm blessed to have right now. It's even harder if I'm in the city. Okay. Um, I, I yeah. can't see the side. I can't see, you know, so we live in this, in this, you know, increasingly in these urban environments that, you know, cut us off from, I guess the one of the few things right now that, that, you know, regardless of scientific explanation is awesome. And that's nature and the power of nature. And, and unfortunately it doesn't come to us except in tragedy, you know, a tsunami, a hurricane, you know, yeah. and then we're suddenly, you know, we're taken aback, but it, that's, a, um, that's, that's the horrific side of awe. Okay. That's not the jubilant side of awe because awe is both, you know, it's jubilant and it's horrific. Yeah. Well, and, and so, now, so that's you know, that's the artist's challenge. That's everybody's challenge. Yeah. But you know, and it, you know, we you're, can't, we you're, can't you're, run from death, but we can certainly spark awe again. We can go out and look at that night sky. Billy Collins says, you know, if you, if you don't have a child, but you know, hold the child of yourself in your arms and go out and look up. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know, um, that that's where I'd kind of like to start getting into some of the. Uh, of course, some of the mythology that was that was talked about um, in Hero's Journey, uh, where okay. where we're talking about the death, the rebirth, um, uh, that that is so much like we were saying a while ago the the uh, the rope path of Hollywood almost since it came out, um, and not just that, but as as a nerd, I'm 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 going to straight say it, comic books too. Um, even though comic hey, we books just and things like Joseph Campbell, Joseph Go Campbell ahead. Foundation just sponsored a a panel with the New York Public Library at Comic Con in New York. On, oh wow! On, on exactly this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly this. Because um, you, you yeah. know, like if even if you look at the uh, the birth, death, resurrection, even Superman, uh, and this was before the the full body of work of Joseph Campbell, things like that. When Superman came out, you know, um, but even that in and of itself, well, it's actually, I think if we look at the dates, you're probably talking the inception of Superman being right around the same time that Campbell was wrestling with this stuff that, you know, in 48 became the earth of a thousand oh, yeah? faces Be- because this, this was, a, you know, this was a, a whole thing as, as you know, I'm, I'm by no means a historian, sure. but you know, when I look back at least to the sweep of the 20th century and, you know, and, and the, the great wars and, you know, the time between the great wars and this, this whole resurgent of what is heroism and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and then how, you know, you, you got these, this like Uber master race and how that gave rise to, to a Hitler. Um, and yeah. how, you know, so how slippery this all was, is well, people trying to understand what it means to, you know, to be a functioning member of, of a, of a society and address its, its, its conceptions and misconceptions about what is appropriate behavior. Okay, Bob. And right now I'm going to tell you straight up. Um, I told you before the show that I realized that we had some kind of kindred ship because of the seminary thing, but, uh, you're creepy. Get out of my head. It's creepy enough in there without you in there right now. That's exactly <laughs> what we were talking about about five, six days ago when we chatted on the phone was how I wanted yeah. to talk about how we as a people, uh, humanity, humanity all over the globe right now has somehow lost this concept of the commonality of the hero and how there's the hero in all of us. There's the hero ever present around us. Hell, man, in this day and age, if you wake up lost? and face the world, you're a hero. Yeah. Um, no, well, but what is it how, that they've lost, though? Because I think there's something really practical here that we can underscore. And I, that is, you know, 
you know, Campbell Faith in says, the common you know, man, no place he, I think. Well, he says that the, he says that the you know the hero is the one of voluntary surrender, um, yeah, and you know surrender to fate. But also, the hero is the one who is in service, in service to something greater than him or herself. Yeah, and and so that's that's the peace that we've lost. What are you going to serve? I mean, that Bob Dylan song, you know, you, you got to serve somebody, and that's you're going to be doing it whether you, whether you want it or not. And yeah. so are you serving the narrow tribal interest? Are you serving your own narrow personal interests? Or have you well, maybe, maybe you've opened it up to your, your – you think you're serving the, the good of your family or your extended family. Or maybe, may, maybe you have a commitment to, to, to serving you, you know, your society in some manner. Um, the, the, can you both do that and then make that leap to, to realizing you're in service to the species? We're in service collectively to the species, to the planet. Yes. Exactly, um, you know, which is the only thing we know about right now. And, well, and, and and but it's real hard to to walk with that wide and embrace. I think for well, most people. And I think I think number one, yes, we're all missing the concept of the hero inside of us, our own hero's journey. Um, but also, like I was saying the other day, we're at this dangerous, dangerous precipice. And you brought it up just a second ago, which is why I was like, y you're creepy. Get out of my head, because that's what I was going to bring up was how dangerously close we are to people wanting a savior instead of a hero. Yeah. And the yeah, savior well, yeah. is the one that forsakes all despite anything else and makes that sacrifice on your behalf to where you no longer have to do that. Um and that's a yeah, well, dangerous they want thing a outside of. Yeah, um, yeah. that that's Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Yeah, and as as a country right now, we are straight up where Germany was after World War One, um, where where we're financially broke. We are broken as a people. We no longer have that common cause, that commonality amongst us. Uh, there is no longer that American spirit that makes us uniquely American. Um, and we're looking for somebody to just reach down and pull us up out of the muck. Uh, whoever it is, good God, I don't care. Um, and that's such a dangerous place to be as a society. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Be be because, again, you know, you, you, if you think about, you know, what's an American? Well, you know, that that's at the source of our problem right now. There was a hegemony that existed among a certain number of people. And they thought this, you know, America was them. And, uh, you know, and... America is, if anything, a kaleidoscope of of cultures and races. But you know, we talk about the melting pot. The thing is, it doesn't melt instantly. <laughs> you no. know, you don't melt instantly. It's more like a boula base. You know, you've got these these more these things that, that haven't all cooked down. And 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 you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it's really really hard for people uh, to. Um, to live with that sense of um, uncertainty and upset and that things they took for granted aren't anymore and to realize that they have to make an active effort. Uh, yeah. and I, I did another long conversation recently on, on, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the, this, uh, this concept of the American dream and, you know, and what does that mean? Um, and, you know, where did it begin? You know, and it began with this idea that America had opportunity for everyone. But then it became, if you were in America, you were entitled to certain things. And, and yes. then the policy and the politics of scarcity enter in. And if you get it, I won't. You know, and then you get into, you know, you get into everything from higher education quotas to, you know, to all to social social welfare programs and, and so on. But there is this this instinctive this pendulum swing of people wanting to just retreat. You know, pull up the fundament, retreat, and that's when you want the despot. You want the autocrat who says, you know, do this. And you say, great, tell me what to do and I'll do it and I'm fine. And if I'm lucky, I'll go to heaven or, or, or whatever yeah, yeah, your reward give, value is. Whatever it is, man, just give me the answer. Yeah, 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 Just give yeah. me the answer. Right. And, um, of course, they Campbell, Campbell points out in, over and over in, his, in his, all his writings based on the, the hero – hero's journey the quest you know when the knights from the round table went out you know each knight entered the forest where it was darkest and there was no path because to go on a path was to follow someone else's and right there is yes. the lie in in saying tell me what to do and i'll that, do it exactly you know, no, that no. is the fallacy what there is to, no you know, map you to your me? forest 
There yeah, is no yeah, map yeah. to your forest. And and I right. say that all the time on this show that what the concept has that has been lost among society, it seems to me, is being able to see both the forest and the trees. And respect. Hey, Chris, you've got to remind that, me when at some point I'll send you a poem called No Maps. And I, and, I would and love that. Exactly about that. It, it, I would it, love that. You know, and, and I say that's what mythology is, okay? Yeah. Mythology are the maps, okay? They're not the journey. They're the maps. Okay. Well, let, let's explore that a little bit. Uh, give, us, give us a good modern example um, of, of uh, a good concept like that, where, where the mythology is the map to what's going on. Because, you know, we say it all the time, history repeats itself. If you're a student of history, you can see these trends in society. It's, it's you know, it, like we were saying at the beginning of the show, um, ancient societies saw things in a cycle. We as a modern society see things in a timeline. Um, right. And it's right. a totally different view of history. And when you start to kind of bend that timeline on itself, you really can see the cyclical nature of history, of societies, yep. of decisions that are yep. made, um, things and, like and that's that. The, and that's the answer to what you, you, you know, the mythology being a map, because the cycles repeat and 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 you can you can take these narratives i mean i just gave you a little one you know the, the little snippet from the the romance of the grail where the knights go out they wait for this collective vision and they each go out on their own to find the grail and realize it and they each go where no one else has gone uh, that myth there is a map for how we you know how we as a if you want to go back to my earlier comment, we as an ensemble hero or a collective hero, um, you know, need to understand what we have to do. So we all gather around the round table. You know, we meet in one or another kind of communal forum in what, you know, online in you know, in a meat meat market. We we wait just like the knights did. Um, they waited for the for the next vision and or, you know, quest to appear. Um, we wait for something that challenges us as a collective, we say, you know, we need to do something about this. And this is the story of all the heroic journeys. You know, we need to do something about this. The land is barren, you know, the grail has been lost. We have to do something about this. So what are we going to do? We're going to all go forward with this in mind. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to do something like, you know, like Kennedy did. We're, we're going to have an initiative to put a man on the moon, or we're going to, you know, explore the South Pole, or we're going to scale this mountain. Um, all of these stories of people doing these things move, can move us to undertake whatever, you know, is presented in front of us. Um, but those are maps of, of, of what it means. They're, they're not the journey. They're just suggestions of people who have undertaken similar kinds of, of, of quests in the past. Um, and, and where will it happen? It will happen locally. I mean, I think that's so important. We can have these big philosophical conversations, um, and they're important. And we can have these cross-cultural dialogues, and they're even more important. But I mean, the, one of the found, things the foundation has are mythological roundtables. And they are you know, locally organizing groups. They're on five continents at this point. Um, and they're addressing what matters to them in their community, because that's how, that's how it starts. And then, you know, you get a few a few roundtables or a few local groups talking to each other and they start to see that it's a bigger problem. It's a regional problem or, or you know, that they can have a greater impact working together. Um, and they all bring their stories. They bring their experiences. They bring their sure. maps. And then they each go forward um, with this common goal. Um, it's yeah. just very hard for us to shape those goals. It It, it is. And, it, you know, I think a lot of that uh... – that comes down to um, learning not to uh, try and fit everything like we were saying earlier within the box of logic. Right. Um, and it, it was a problem that I had for so long that it led to horrible, horrible issues in my life um, where I was just like personally stymied with development. Um, I couldn't move forward as a person because I got I got so caught up in – why things happen the way that they happened instead of the way I thought that they would happen. And then years later, it was one of those like, wow, that, that was pretty friggin' egotistical. Um, 
You know, like for, you mean it's not all about me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this was like after I'd been in the seminary and things like that, Bob. So like that led me down an even even worse spiral of thought of like, good God, I'm somebody who knows better. Like there was all of a, about three weeks ago where I was given my I caught myself giving myself a pat on the back, and this was an utter modern society scenario. Um, I was giving myself a pat on the back for doing something uh, good for somebody. And it was one of those like, okay, stop that. Uh, that's what a normal human being is supposed to do. Like a normal, a normal human being is supposed to do that. Um, you shouldn't yeah. be congratulating yourself for doing it. You, you, for being a human you being, jackass, right. you know, for, for being a proper human being and doing what you're supposed to do anyway. Um, and I kind of caught myself doing that and it was like, wow, what a modern thought concept. Um, the, <laughs> the, the choice of hubris over humility, the choice of, uh, self codulation and making yourself feel good. Um, when it's one of those, like you shouldn't, and you hear it all the time, especially coming up right now. I mean, we may as well just call it Christmas. Uh, as we speak, you know what I mean? Um, you go anywhere and the Christmas decorations are out. People are uh, like Halloween it and even over and they're trying to sell Christmas already. And you hear it all the time. Like, oh yeah, I give every Christmas cause it makes me feel good. And it's like, shouldn't you give all the time anyway? Right. Right. <laughs> not, not just that one time to feel good. Um, Muhammad Ali said being of service is the rent we pay for our room here on earth absolutely um you know yeah you we should just i think it's i mean this is you know it's easy you know with a you know with a beer in your hand or in my case a, a glenn livid in my hand in tribute to joe to good on you wa yeah. wax philosophical but let's not forget that it is pretty bloody hard to go out there and maintain that kind of a position in a world that is kind of so materialistic and so yes. awash with cynicism yeah. as ours. And that's, I think, the other saving thing, though. You know, why is popular cinema um, so rich in mythological adventures and why are video games so popular and why are comics the most read things that library offers, um, which I didn't know. Comics yeah. and graphic novels are the most yep. requested things. Now. Why? Because these can take people to a land of imaginative possibility where they don't have to confront um, yeah. the bullshit that, 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 that they mm -hmm. feel they have to deal with all the time just to be a human being. Yeah. And, and it's so entirely true. Um, and that's why I said earlier, we, we discount the hero we are every day for waking up and confronting the world as it exists. And going the, forth, going the, forth to, to joyfully participate in the sorrows of the world. Yeah. This, and and, and, the Bodhisattva. and it, I was just about to get into the concept of finding bliss. Um, and that was the first the first thing on my list here was the story of Sangsara and Nirvana, um, mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. of being able, being able to find calm amongst the storm, um, being able to go, man, the world right now is just crazy. You know, I'm I'm glad I'm at least centered on what I'm doing. And there and, there and my is the real key to be things. centered on what you're doing. I mean, you know what's what what is what is this state of bliss i mean it's it's doing the thing you can't not do that's yes. not always um that's not always pleasant i mean i i suppose for, or popular you know, to jump well oh well yeah i mean but jump back to you know our common you know christian background in that scene in the garden of gethsemane you know let let this chalice pass the, yeah not, you know uh, th but you do it, um, and, and the and this, what's the what's the one thing that you can sort of know when you're you're there, and that is that time stands still. Um, suddenly, you, suddenly you're out of time. Um, you're not watching, the, you know, a, a, you know, you're not watching the clock. You know, you you're doing something that that fills you um, completely, and. And, you know, what's funny is it, it, this loops back around what we are talking about. You know, there's the, the whole science of happiness now and happiness, uh, a lot of experimentation about what yeah. makes people happy. 
you know, and the number one thing is believing that they are part of and in service to something greater than themselves. And that takes us right back to the idea of service, of heroism, of, of being, you know, a member of the human species on this planet to feeling like even though, even though in my little village here, <laughs> I, I have all these problems and all these things I got to deal with on an other level. Um, there's this part of me that knows that, that I am a, a note in this bigger symphony. Well, and, and that's just it. Um, no, knowing that amongst the field of stars, you're still a star. Mm, yeah. You know, that yeah. somewhere out there amongst all those stars and swirls of galaxies, someone else is possibly looking out and going, wow, look <laughs> at that cool blue one right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. um, and, yep. and, and that, that's that whole, uh, that whole moment of the hero's journey, that, that concept of now I have to leave myself. Now I have to leave my comfort zone. Um, and unfortunately yep. we talk about it on this show all the time. Uh, the, the fact that our brain is a negative feedback machine, um, <laughs> our brain thrives and learns off of negative feedback. It learns more off of fire is hot than it does off any lesson it did gathering the wood. Yep. And, and yep. the problem is our body, the rest of our body is totally wired to learn from good things. Um, and it's something that I used to have to teach the junior high and high school students that I worked with years ago was at times you have to kind of learn to shut off your brain and just listen to your belly. If you're That's in a wisdom. weird situation, shut off your brain and just focus on your navel. And if you feel right. kind of that little like tugging poke, uh, pay attention to that. That sure. may mean get out of the room. That may mean go away. What have you? But listen to that. Forget anything your brain says at that moment. Um, <laughs> and and listen solely to that. And that that's really a lot to do with um, learning what that center is. Learning what your center is. Learning what your point of calm is. Uh, I will not deny the fact that over the years I've lost some of that center myself. Um, other than exposure, exposing people to the light of truth, uh, with a capital T that that's really my only other center. Um, aside from that, you know, it's, it's hard, uh, for us in a modern society with the barrage of negativity that we have to maintain a positive aspect, to maintain a good center, to maintain a, uh, a, and, and I'm not even going to use it as a religious term here, but more a philosophic term, a sanctified center. Um, yeah. Somewhere that is meant to keep everything out. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, you have to, you know, Joe, Joe talks about that a lot in some of his work about the, the fact that, you know, the artist has a studio or has a place where they go and they, they can shut out the rest of the quotidian world and that, you know, everybody needs a, a, a way to balance it out. Uh, and, and I say balance intentionally. I remember I have a very good friend who was, can't yeah. keep getting, you know, he's really stressed. And, uh, and he told me, he told me, you know, like, he, he just didn't get it. He'd been, you know, he'd been sitting practicing meditation for like an hour once a day or twice, once or twice a day for weeks and weeks now. And he wasn't feeling any less stressed. And I said, wait a minute, hold on, man. You know, you're a computer programmer. You sit at your your keyboard all day long, and now you think to to, to balance that out, you should sit some more. Yeah. You know, go yeah. on, take a walk. You know, hit them yeah. all. Um, you know, but we we all need to find that thing that is the balance um, that that takes us out of our uh, out of what we grapple with most of the time, and and puts us in a space where our imagination can start to conceive of other possibilities. And, and we can do so that in dialogue too. I mean, I we think can. that's a big, big way to do it. And, and, you know, that's, as I told you the other day, uh, I'll, I'll 
jibbing aside from you to me. Uh, as I told you the other day when we were discussing this show and its concept, um, it's the concept of at one point we used to sit down on a bar stool and have a drink like this and talk about deep concepts. Um, right. right. And at some point we lost that. Um, we lost the idea of being able to philosophically disagree with someone but not see them as the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Well, we outsourced our judgment. Ooh, wow. Wow. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. I, mean, I just think, I think we do that all the time. You know, because, because we don't have to make a decision. <laughs> because making those decisions is hard. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's exactly like I was saying earlier. I mean, unfortunately, instead of... Um, wanting the hero's journey instead of wanting the journey of Odysseus and his men and wanting to go out and conquer new things and boldly look at the horizon and and do that go where no man has gone before. Um, yep. uh, even like on this show, having the conversations that nobody's willing to have. Um, yeah, like, yeah. Well, so that's why we started the conversations of a higher order on, the, on our website back in the mid nineties. Because there yeah. was no place for them, you know? and, well, and the, the, we could see the electronic conversations, which were you know, sort of drivel. We, we could see that they were keeping people from even, you know, getting on a bar stool somewhere and having a conversation or venturing out. So there needed yeah. to be some place for it. There needs to be a place for it, you know. So, you know, uh, and I was teasing you about about your program that you know <laughs> oh you mean it's more than more than more than football more than just football more than football <laughs> yeah yeah and, but i but i i've now come to understand that that it indeed is although football is a good thing on a bar stool it's, too it, you know? it can be a good thing we, we shouldn't be elitist about this it can be uh, no absolutely coach. not um yeah. it's it it is bliss for some people um, yep. because yeah, it is, it is a means of, like you said, getting away from the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's a means of utter mm -hmm. escape. Um, and, but it also that, can, again, as I, I started to say, I was a soccer coach and you can see where that kind of, you know, what, uh, team uh, spirit can become deadly. Um, it can, it becomes it can. tribalism in a different way. You know, we outsource our violence and, you know, kill them, take them down and, you know, <laughs> Are you yeah, root for and, them? I root for you now. And, and, and even the conversation of and, – and something that uh, I'm going to be talking about with my friend on Gray Matters, uh, Michael Devine, is mm -hmm. uh, talking about like what, what's that whole concept about like rioting and destroying your whole city when you win? <laughs> Like what? What's that even about? Like I, I, I can't yeah. say I've ever been so celebratory that I wanted to tear some stuff up like that. Um, right, right. Uh, like yeah. now, um, you know what? I mean, part of it, you know, you, we could we could slide off into archetypes for for far more time than we have left. But you know, you were absolutely. talking about it in your own in your own experience, and you know, what just comes to mind is you know, the Greeks put it in Apollo and Dionysus. Yes. And to the extent that we're we're holding it all in and trying to be Apollonian about this, you know, we're we you know we we <laughs> we you know when when we flip we flip, you know, and yeah. and and, uh, and 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 that's all. You know, that's those two poles, and that's why returning full circle, it takes three people on the bridge to right the ship. Because exactly. If you get two up there, no matter how you get it, you're going to get polarized. A third perspective, you can't light a figure in space without more than three sources of light. So I That's don't think right. you can entertain an idea without more than three voices. So I wish you your partner were here. You cannot navigate without three points. That's right. You need a point relative in space. Yep. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, and I say it on this show all the time, even politically in this country. We are in a right. lean to. Anything right. that only has any structure that only has two walls is a lean to. Um, That's it. And I really don't want to live in a lean to. That is not a steady structure. It's not a good structure. <laughs> Especially not in a time of hurricanes. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, to and, deal with another metaphor. But, and, yeah. you know, I, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time tonight. I know you have a crazy packed schedule, much like myself coming off 
off of weeks of travel, things like that. I would love to have you on again to discuss things uh, in the realm of modern mythology, in the realm of uh, initiation rituals in society, things sure. like that. There's a lot of stuff we didn't get to. Oh, we, we st- promised ourselves we were going to talk about. It's, but, uh, it's it's such, it, the the problem is I know myself um I'm I'm platonic in that way um I <laughs> I know myself and if I know if we rabbit hole two more times I'm gonna keep you for two and a half hours um <laughs> and I do not want to monopolize your time like that Bob uh our conversation well, we'll get has together been, again for another conversation meantime I'll shoot you some uh some some words of some uh, gods and other poets that I think that would uh, be you, you might find of interest. That would be great. Some of the themes um, we've talked about. Yeah, because there is there is nothing like words from the muse. Um, I am sitting yep. I am sitting in my hearth of the muse in my home right now, uh, putting this out. So uh, the fact that you brought that up at the end of my show is a is a very personal personal note to me, um, and Good. something that I will say is is my moment of resonance today. Uh, I I encourage everybody to find that moment of resonance in their day, be it a squirrel eating a nut under a tree, um, uh, a flower blowing in the breeze, uh, a dad pushing a kid down the road in a stroller, whatever. Um, Find that point that resonates with you during the day that makes you vibrate, that makes you tingle. Um, Those are the moments you're looking for. It makes you feel alive. Yeah, those are the moments of bliss. Um, Those are the moments that... Um, that Joseph Campbell was talking about in his great work for us to to really take the time to start to pay attention to again um, as a society. So, um, Bob, please do tell everybody where they can go to find the great work of the Joseph Campbell Foundation, um, where they can go to order books, where they can go to get movies, videos, um, all of the all of the great weekly and monthly offerings you all have now. Um, yeah, where can they yeah, go for we, all this got, stuff? We've got a lot of stuff. It's uh, JCF for Joseph Campbell Foundation, jcf.org. And uh, if you sign up, we, we do these myth blasts. We have different people writing a, something uh, each week. And every month we celebrate a theme and look at how it resonates through Campbell's work and through cultural resources. And uh, and uh, and we have a giveaway uh and so it's it, it's a it's rich and robust and a, a doorway to a, a as we say a a network of information a community of individuals. Well, and uh, you know, to know that there are people like you out there, like I said earlier in your intro, carrying on this Promethean torch um, of knowledge of wisdom that was put forth by such a great, the only equivalation in my mind that can be made is modern philosopher. Um, when you're talking about um, things that have moved mankind for millennia, um, that's philosophy. That goes beyond literature to me. That goes that goes straight into epistemology, into the study of God, um, in, into the study of our place within the universe. Um, and where we unifiedly as a humanity have found our place in the universe. Um, and I would love to have you on again to talk about themes like that, to talk about archetypes, um, all kinds of things, Bob. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on this evening. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you, Chris. And when we get together again, we'll continue to explore humankind's one great story. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go ahead and end this episode. Bob, please do hold the line for me. I would love to chat with you for one more second uh, just sure. as we end things. We've got the intro going out right now. While you are online, checking out jcf.org, the great work of the Joseph Campbell Foundation and all of Joseph Campbell's uh compiled works there please do make sure to stop on by the dudes and beer podcast uh, dudesandbeer.com that's where you can find all of our episododes things like this things like episodes thanks with for listening Michael to this Devine, episode of the dudes um, and beer podcast else. until next time everybody to listen to our remember, audio streams you can't be good with us at least live, be good at it download the we'll official dudes soon. and beer app on android and i devices available on google play and itunes markets For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, 
SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.